If I can ask everyone to get the best out of this journey, we're going on a journey. If you can come here to the screen to make the most out of it, otherwise you won't be on the bus, the bus through time. You guys might be a tiny bit close, but if you want to, that's, that's fine. Up to you. Can you see from there? At the back, can you guys see? I think you can see. I know there's, there's a partition in the way. So as I said, we're going to go on a journey. It's going to be a bus um, through time. And the title of the talk is The History of the Shrine. I realize I'm in front of the pillar. So it's about the shrine of Imam Hussein in Karbala. As I mentioned, we're going to go through a journey. We're going to go through the various uh, times that it's gone through up until today. Uh, it's gone through a lot of changes. The research done towards into this um, has really staggered me and, and subhanAllah, the shrine is still here today. So let's start the journey. So about 1,338 years ago, something significant occurred in history. We all know what that is. We commemorate it every year. That was the Battle of Karbala. It took place that many years ago. So our journey today starts to there. Three days after the Battle of Karbala, we know that the companions lay on the floor, our Imam lay on the floor, and that's when the burials, our hadith tell us that's when the first burial took place. The companions along with the Imam were buried in modern day Karbala. And our hadiths also say that Imam Sajjad was able to attend as well along with Banu Asad who were the tribe in that area who buried the Imam along with his companions. So the start of our journey will take us through the following. So we have some artistic uh, impressions of the, the land of Karbala at the time and you'll see it looked something like this. So the year is 681 AD, 61 AH and this is how it looked. And as you know, Karbala was a desert. There was nothing there. The battle took place in the middle of nowhere, under the sun. So Karbala was a desert. And this is how it would have looked like, something along the lines of this. In the same sort of period, not long too after, a roof was built on top. And it looks something like this. People were able to come. As I said, the tribe of Banu Asad were able to come, pay their condolences, read Ziyarah, read Quran under the, underneath the roof to protect them from the sun. And about three years later, this is an artistic impression of a tomb made out of wood that was placed on top of the grave. Obviously, this grave is a significant site. Um, so this was placed about three years later on top. And in the time of Al-Mukhtar Thaqafi in the year 686 AD, the first building was built at the shrine. And we have another artist's impression here and it looks something like this. Not only was it the first building, it was also the first dome that was built. And you had the first sort of people that lived around the area. Again, it was mo mainly the Benu Asa tribe that lived there. And uh, the building itself, there's another picture here. It had two entrances. So whereas today some of you may have been to Karbala, there are multiple entrances. At the time, there was two. There's only one entrance and an exit. And it looks at something like this. If we fast forward a bit, we go forward into the next century. So we're at the 8th century. If we stick to the English calendar, I think we can understand better. So we go back to around the 8th century. It, it expanded and it looks something like this. So the shrine began to expand. You now have a wall around the shrine. The dome still exists. And more and more people are coming to visit. So to facilitate that, the shrine began to expand. Is everyone still with me in this journey? Yep. Cool. So, 9th century, we're saying that the shrine began to expand. Many of you will realize what, uh, this familiar site. There's a road here which is familiar. It's also known as Bain al-Haramain. exists today as it did then. And people began to live there. So whereas today, if you go to Karbala today, you'll see it's, uh, you can walk between the shrines. Back then, you have to remember Karbala was a small village. So people lived between here. And this is showing a bird's eye view of the, the settlements around the area. And at this point, Karbala is still a very small village in the 9th century. So 
when I was doing my research, and many of you may, have asked, may be wondering, was the shrine ever destroyed in our history? Was there a point in time where it may have been demolished? Was there someone in history that had such hatred that wanted to remove the remembrance of the shrine? And unfortunately, the answer is yes. And Al-Mutawakkil Al-Abbasi, who was the 10th Abbasid Khalif, unfortunately had deep hatred towards the Ahlul Bayt. He disliked the Ahlul Bayt. So much so that not only did he destroy it once, not twice, not three times, but on four separate occasions, he attempted to destroy the shrine of Imam Hussein. Starting on the first attempt in 847 AH. So you have to remember where we are in the time right here. We're still around 847, 9th century. That was the first time he destroyed the shrine. And we have an artist's impression of how that would have looked like. Um, but to showcase the severity of his hatred, not only did he destroy in those buildings that we were showing you, he, only, he also plowed the land. And when I say plowed the land, he, he got a cow. You know how they, in farming you have a cow and then you have a metal compartment behind it and they plow the land? He did that to the shrine. He did that all to remove the remembrance of Imam Hussein. And not only did he do that, he flooded the land as well. And uh, he tried to remove it that way. So here we have a nice little kangaroo. It's a flood that took place in Australia some time ago. And you may be asking, you know, why, why, am, I, why am I showing you this? So this is why. Uh, so he tried to flood the land, but uh, our hadith and research say that the water did not touch the shrine of Mount Hussein. It went round the shrine. A bit like this little slump where the kangaroo is, is sitting on, the water is going around. Obviously, it's, it's underneath, but it's going round. The reason I mention this, in Arabic, there's a word, there's a saying that says, that, that says, Har al ma Har al ma What that means in Arabic, not that hot water, but it means it's something else. It means when the water goes around an object. So when there's a, a, a rock and there's a flooding or there's a car or whatever and the water goes around, that phrase har al ma means that. That's what happened when al mutawakkil tried to flood the, the shrine. So then after that incident, everyone or anyone that lived in Karbala was known as Ha'il al husseini And today you may have friends or family or know of tribes known as, as al hari That's where that phrase comes from. People were known as al ha al husseini who lived and remained in that land after these floodings took place by al mutawakkil So we move on to al muntasar al-Abbasi, who was al mutawakkils son. Born in 837, died in 862, as you can see. Fortunately, he was different to his father. He was a lover of the Ahl al-Bayt, a promoter of the Ahl al-Bayt, a lover of Imam Ali. So, he was also said to have been involved in the assassination of his father. So, whereas his father was a hate of Ahl al-Bayt, and one thing to mention, his father also introduced a tax to anyone who wanted to visit the shrine, banned the visitation of the shrine, this is all before he eventually destroyed it. Uh, but whereas his son, Al-Muntasar, was a lover of the Ahlul Bayt. So what he done, he erected a, a pole uh, on top of the place. Uh, it was a huge iron pole, they say, or a big flag to show the significance of the site, of the area, so that it is not forgotten in history. And some time later, a new shrine was rebuilt. And the artist's impression says that it looks something like this. Remember, this is all artist's impression. There was a new shrine was built later in the 9th century. So whereas the shrine was destroyed, it was then rebuilt. So we're now at a stage where the shrine is rebuilt. As I mentioned earlier, that Karbala was still a village at this point. Um, but today we know it's a, it's a big city with millions of people that flock to it year in, year out. So at this point in history, Karbala is now expanding. So if we fast forward to the 11th century, we now see that there's a wall around the city of Karbala. No longer is it a village with one tribe, or with visitors coming and going. It's a thriving city with pilgrims coming in. You can see in this impression, there is the two familiar sites of the shrines. You have Al-Abbas and Al-Hussein. And at this point, the city was thriving. It was now a, a city in its own right. Gone were the days where it was a desert in our initial journey. So if we go back, the shrine began to expand further at this point. So. This is an artist's impression of within the shrine. So you see now there is a little prayer area. 
They've constructed more areas around the shrine. So the theme that I'm getting at here is that the shrine and the city continue to expand uh, and expand. So the other question that comes forward to us is, have there been any Western explorers that have explored the city or may have drawn the city? Uh, you're probably going to get what I'm saying. Yes, there has been. So the first known individual from the West is to have explored the city is a chap called Karsten Niebuhr. I probably haven't pronounced the name right, uh, but you can Google him. He was born in 1733 and died in 1815. He was a German mathematician, uh, famous at the time. And under the, the orders of the Danish king, there was an expedition to Arabia between the years of 1761 and 1767. In those times, they went to Arabia to explore. And you have to remember, at the time, the world wasn't as small as it is today. The world was mysterious. And the West saw the East as some exotic location, unknown what's over there. So the expedition, its goal was to find out what, what existed in the area. So this is not, no longer an artistic impression. It is a painting, but it's based on someone who actually saw the shrine at the time. One of the earliest known documents that we have. And this was his painting. You can see there is a minaret and there's a dome there and the familiar wall around it. So that was in the period of 1761 to 1767. We continue on the tour that we're having here today. Another individual from the West, Theodore Noldecki. Again, I probably pronounced it wrong or destroyed the pronunciation there. But born in 1836, died in 1930. So we're getting closer now to modern times. He was a famous German Orientalist. He was an expert of language. Um, not only that, he wrote a biography of Rasulullah and he studied the Quran in many different languages and he was famous at the time. So he also visited Karbala. This was his artistic impression while well, drawing of what he actually saw. And again, you've got the dome, you've got the minarets, similar to our previous chap who went to visit. So it shows you that the shrine pretty much remained the same between those periods. But there was another individual and his painting really struck to me. And his name is Robert H. Clive. He's a British chap. And there's this book called Nineveh and the Holy Land. Now when I searched this, this was bought by the British Museum in 2015. It's a book with various paintings. Robert Clive went and he did, explored the Middle East, explored uh, Persia and Iraq. The book itself, as I said, is called Nineveh and the Holy Land. But within that, you've got Persian Gulf and Black Sea, Robert Clive, sketches, the sketches of, the, of Robert Clive. Published in 1852. So we're now, we're now we're going back slightly, 1852. He published this. Initially, you might think, oh, this is a painting, this is a picture of you know no, not so long ago this is actually a painting by robert in 18 published in 1852 of karbala and you can see there's there's three minarets there you're probably wondering what, what happened to this i don't i don't recognize this from today's world um well that actually was removed um what i've been told is it was presented danger to the area so they had to remove it um it was a derelict condition However, you see the dome is there, you see people going around. It's, it's very familiar to what it is today. And this, for me, when I saw this, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, so 1852 published, and the book uh, was acquired. Uh, I don't know if it's the original book, but it was acquired by the British Museum. And it's not on show, but uh, what they do is they usually acquire these types of books and they keep them in the archives. So let's, let's move to the modern era. And... Um, talk about uh, the shrine itself and there's one thing that there's a one one occasion that I cannot forget to mention and that is the 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 uprising of 1991 the famous uprising of 91 unfortunately it did fail uh, but Karbala was attacked by Saddam Hussein and his forces and there's a video that I wanted to play from a famous documentary called Saddam's Killings Fields and if Mehdi is able to play the video I'm going to ask him to play it from minute number two and uh, I'll just stay silent and you guys watch the video. This is a famous documentary. Before us to minute two, and then we'll watch that. And then we'll reconvene. Shia rose against Saddam's tyranny. And here at Kerbala, Saddam took savage revenge. The 
There were no TV cameras here to record what happened. Only this extraordinary amateur videotape shot by two brothers, one of whom was killed. Their pictures show the climax of the Shia rebellion at the end of March. The revolt had almost succeeded, but Saddam's Republican Guard and their tanks had been left intact by the Allies. And in the end, the rebels were hopelessly outgunned. The city is now surrounded. With time running out and no hope of escape, a last embrace. Inside the same shrine, desperate women and children can only call on God now to help them. Most of these people are about to die. I think we'll leave it there. So if, you, if you pause it now, Mehdi, and then go to the next slide. But the reason I showed that video was, was to sort of highlight many of us may have been to Karbala uh, in the last five years or so, the last ten years or so. So we know pretty much how it looks like today. Um, but in 91, this was the uprising that took place. People took refuge in the shrines. The shrines became a point of refuge, but even then, uh, that wasn't enough. And a lot of them did not make it. The shrine itself was, it was survived, but it was attacked. The city, however, uh, was destroyed and was then rebuilt. And it said it was, I think it was finished in 94. Uh, and then we have the Bain al-Haramain as we see it today from 94-ish um, was rebuilt. But to end on a slightly not so sad note, uh, this is a picture of my dear father. And this is outside his family's house or my family's house in Karbala. So this is about a four minute walk from the shrine of Imam Hussein. And it was built in 1906's house. So my father was born in it. I remember when, when I went and visited, um, he, he showed me the corner. He's like, oh yeah, I was born there. His father was born there as well, and his father. So my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were all born in this house. Um, and to show, showcase you how it, sort of works in Karbala, a, a small portion of the house is owned by the, the shrine or the atibah of Al Imam Hussein. So the house is also used to serve the pilgrims. And this is common in Karbala. So pilgrims would come here, they would stay here. Uh, not only that, people who were getting married, they would use this house as a, as, as a hall or the wedding venue. Um, so one thing before I end, and I want to make sure I don't forget this, a lot of the research that took place for this was uh, done with, with the help of my father who works for uh, the Hussaini Encyclopedia. Many of the artist impressions that you saw, unfortunately their work is all in Arabic. Um, hopefully one day it will be translated to English. So a lot of this was picked out of the, the books um, that were written back in 98, I believe, or the first editions. But I think I'll leave it there. Hopefully we've, we've learned something. The journey does end here. The bus ends, and I'll let you guys go back to the main, uh, the main attraction over there. But thank you very much, and salallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.